It's a non-alcoholic beer, even though it's less than 0.5? Well, that's the definition of a non-alcoholic beer. Less than 0.5. There's a lot of things you can go for, like making a beer. And I think if you put this beside a few other beers, like maybe somebody's doing a non-alcoholic IPA or maybe somebody's doing a non-alcoholic milk stout or something. And you ask like somebody who's kind of just coming in blind to say, well, which one's like the most interesting? Mm -hmm. I don't think ours would be the most interesting. That's not what we're going for. Sure. What we're going for is we want something that is going to be drinkable, um, but also they're going to be able to have like one or two, like if they're trying to drink with one of their friends right. who's having a few pints. It almost looks like a holiday drinker. Like I could be at a holiday party just drinking a ton of these and feel good about it. And then drive home. And then drive be fine. home. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guest is Ronan McGovern, founder of Sandy Mount Technologies M.5, a non-alcoholic pilsner that recently became available in stores. The single biggest cost that beer manufacturers face is the transport weight of their beverages. The vast majority of that weight? Water. Ronan has developed a technology that enables him to remove 75% of the water from beer so that manufacturers are only shipping the essentials. The water can then be added back in wherever the beer is sold with no loss in taste. Think of this like using a soda fountain. Coke syrup is mixed with CO2 and water on site, giving you the beverage that you know and love. So listen in as we cover everything from why he decided to make a non-alcoholic beer, the importance of his taste match process, and how he named his company after a beach that his grandmother used to take walks on, only to find out after all the paperwork was signed that he got the name wrong. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have Sandy Mont Technologies. Sandy Mont Technologies, yep. What's up, Ronan? How's it going? Going very well. Ronan, what is Sandy Mont for people listening? Right. Well, easiest analogy is to think of uh, Coca-Cola for beer. Okay. In terms of? We have technology that allows brewers to distribute their beer in a much more compact format. Yeah. And they can ship it as, as a concentrate and directly to bars yep. where water would be added in, kind of like a fountain. It's a more sophisticated dispense machine we have. Um, or they could ship it in bulk in large tankers internationally. Um, again, as it concentrates so much smaller volume. So, so the, the way when people ask me like, oh, you're coming, we're here in Boston right now or in Woburn, Mass. And they're like, oh, who are you going to see today? What's on the podcast agenda? Right, right. And I'm like, you know, we're going to see Ronan and he was at MIT and you guys found a way to create a polymer and you were using that polymer or trying to use it to desalinate water. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't give myself too much credit on the chemistry. <laughs> I'm not an epic chemist. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, so I'm more about building processes. Um, you know, we do have, we do have a unique membrane. That's the filter mm -hmm. that allows us to pull water out of beer while retaining all of the, the flavor, the source water minerals and the proteins. And you're right that I worked on membranes at MIT. Um, and I did look at them for seawater desalination, which is Know, where polymer membranes are largely used today. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've done at Sandy Mount, though, is we've taken technology, you know, from seawater desalination, and then we've developed that. We've developed systems. We've developed membranes um, related to what's used for seawater desalination um, that can be used for uh, the beer industry. And I guess the problem you're solving at the end of the day, or one of the biggest ones, is transportation. Right? These right. huge companies. When you think about it, it makes sense. There's so much beer at any liquor store, but what is really being transported in these trucks and vans is water, right? 98% right. of beer or something like that is water. It and is. So, do you know the number of how much money these companies spend just shipping water around the country? Yeah, I mean, transporting beer is probably, you know, 40 billion plus. You could, okay. Depending on how much of the last mile distribution you pull in, sure, the number can even go higher. So but it's expensive. It's a big, It's a big line item for any company. It's a big line item. Um, I think it's a big sustainability line item as well. Like mm. this bottle of beer, you know, if, if this was to be imported with, with Sandy Mount technology, we'd be taking out 150 grams of CO2 just for this bottle. Okay. You know, um, so there's, there's a big... There's that much CO2? There's a lot of CO2 in transport. I mean, you're transporting water. And so if you can, if you can bring that into a bar and you can bring it in a, a high gravity form, which is kind of the, the compact beer that we allow brewers to make yeah you're knocking off about 150 grams there for every for every pint that's being poured and then you're yeah. adding it on site and you're adding it on site yeah from the mains water which yeah. is being filtered with our little box that goes into the bar yeah. so when you first started the company at some point the question is can you make the beer taste the same right right or, or or even before you did that 
Was it you just reaching out to these huge companies saying, I have a concept? You know, how right. did you go ahead and get your first pilot in place or even your first your first customer to test this out with you? Yeah, so and that's how it started because I was looking at different industries and I didn't totally. know I was definitely going to do beer. Yeah. I was looking at wastewater treatment. I was looking at oil and gas. I could talk about why we did beer maybe versus some of the others, but I did talk to some of the supply chain executives and they found it surprising that somebody could make um, a compact beer that would not compromise on taste. A concentrate. Because there's, yeah, because they're so fo- focused on brand. Like the whole value of their business is based on that brand and people's perception. Right. And they've, um, it's funny because I can imagine having a meeting with you and you've taken it for granted already. You've already taken for granted the cost of shipping. You've already admitted that you're... On their side? Yeah. Right? Yeah, so they're, they know that like transport is huge. Right. So they're not thinking about... They're not thinking about at that stage, specifically, where are we going to put this? Specifically, how are we going to, you know, deliver beers to the bar at 150 grams less CO2? And what are the (laughs) savings for that? They're thinking just, okay, like, I just want to taste this. I want to get something going to see if it's true that you can get a match on taste. And so we've been running for about three and a half years since we raised the first money. Um, At the start of that time, I had a prototype making one bottle per day. and Very efficient. Right, right. <laughs> right now we make systems that are like a very large craft brewery in one in one machine. But but back then we spent probably the first year um, scaling that process and demonstrating that we could get the taste match, and um, that's pretty involved because what does taste match mean? Well, it means that a brewer has to run their uh, trained sensory panel, so they will take the beer before our process. It'll go through uh, the Revos technology, as we call it. Um, and then they will add back in filtered water. Mm-hmm. So they'll compare that blended sample with the original and they will run that on a taste panel. So they'll have three samples. They'll have two of the original and one of the blended okay. or two blended, one original. And then they'll have, you know, between usually 15 and 30 people that are trained and they're all testing to see whether they can see the difference. Oh my God. And then they run statistics on that to see whether there's a statistical difference between the original and the blended sample. When you say trained, these are like Cicerones or like how, how trained? Yeah, they're like trained on that specific brand. Okay. So they would be an expert <laughs> in that incredible. like really specific <laughs> lager. Like somebody's a Corona expert, somebody's a, you know, a Heineken expert, somebody's a Sam Adams. And these they people just, exist. They know the brand back to front. They literally know how it tastes after two months, after three months. They know like if it's been stored at, you know, room temperature okay. for a month versus whether it's been stored cold. The first time this happened, was that a little bit nerve wracking? Just being like, I hope we got this and, and they don't like come back and be like, no, this doesn't taste anything like the original. So it's not that, it's not like that of much of a brick wall because they'll start and they'll send in a brewmaster mm-hmm. and somebody who's kind of technical slash business, like good at both. Mm-hmm. And they'll just be sitting around a table with us and we'll be tasting with them. Okay. So we'll get a sense from that, like how does, how's it going? And then you run through to like the taste panel, but but are you able to take anything in the process? Like, or is there anything on your if side? If it's not right. Yeah. Are you coming yeah. back and saying, okay, we got to. So like at the start, the biggest issue that we had, we were still learning about like cleanability, uh, cleanability of the systems and exactly how you clean them exactly right. And that was a factor. Clean what systems? Uh, the machine for making the beer concentrate. Okay. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So once that we honed pretty fast, the next issue then, and this like persists, not just for us, but any process, oxygen. Tell me Beer more. is incredibly oxygen sensitive. What does that mean specifically? It means like if you have more than 50 parts per billion of oxygen. It's that specific. Yeah. You're going to taste an aging in that beer pretty rapidly. And so wow. 50 parts per billion, like that's, you know, that's a typical standard that brewers will look for having less than that amount of oxygen in their beer. But so I know something about brew making when you're making beer. Yeah. You're not taking into account any sort of, are you t- you're not taking oxygen ppm at all are you in our process in your process you are but i mean right. any any brewer the recipe would would just contain ingredients as opposed to like or would it be that specific is it that granular like this yeah do, so do, there's there's a few steps as you know in making beer you make the wort so you have the grains so you extract the grains into the water now during that process you might need quite a bit of oxygen mm-hmm. and that's beneficial during during that phase but once your beer is fermented so once the alcohol is there okay. it's ready to go okay. at that point onwards you do not want any oxygen yeah because the oxygen is going to affect the flavor profile that you have in the beer from there okay so that's where they're starting to measure okay i need to be below 50 parts per billion got it and yeah a thing that 
is not immediately obvious, but it's true is that it's really hard to do that at small scale. So actually, totally. you know, brewing at home, really hard to brew like a lager, mm-hmm. a Pilsner, um, because actually a Pilsner is probably one of the most sensitive. It doesn't have a lot of flavor. It's yeah. like a kind of refreshing taste. So if you have that oxygen, then you're going to be more susceptible to, to noticing the off flavor. So that's why it's so hard to brew a Pilsner at home. Yeah. That's going to have a good shelf life. You know, it's funny. I always ask brewers whenever they go to a brewery, I'm like, what, what is it that you ask for that will tell you everything about the brewery? that you're visiting and they always say the Pilsner. Right, right, right. And then I'm like, oh, really? And then I'd ask like, how come not the IPA? And they say the IPA hides all the imperfections, actually. <laughs> right. It's a beer for imperfections. And so it masks all of it. Yeah, so like, what do you think the hardest beer, what's the hardest non-alcoholic beer to make? I've never even had the water. <laughs> I don't know. Like if you look at styles like ale, stout. Oh, and, I see. You know, lager, IPA. Which of those do you think would be the hardest to stout? Make I'm gonna go stout. I'm gonna go IPA. You're gonna go IPA. Is is it a pilsner again? What you said, non-alcoholic beer, right? Yeah. Let's say you want to make a non-alcoholic beer. Yeah. I'm, well, let's back you, into this. Yeah. So so stouts typically have a uh, well, they can, but I I would say IPAs on on average would have a higher alcohol percentage, right? Than the other ones. Right. Right. Okay, so I mean, it's it's a nuanced answer because there's different reasons it can be hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's an answer I want, but yeah, there's a few answers. If you have more alcohol to start, you've got to take more out. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. going to take you a bit longer. So okay. it's harder in that sense. Um, you know, a stout kind of like if you have a beer that's really heavy or that has a lot of, um, say, cloudiness, haze, yeah. then that's also going to be harder if you're doing a filtration process, especially because right. it's got kind of more suspended matter in it. Yeah. Um, but I think from a flavor standpoint, what's going to be difficult is the same with the oxygen comment um, that if you try and dealkalize a Pilsner, well, a Pilsner's got such a subtle flavor, that's going to be pretty hard to maintain right. when you're pulling out the alcohol. And um, that's what we're doing with the 0.5 brand, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later. Yeah, we'll talk about it now. So we're, um, we're drinking this beer. It's called Less Than 0.5. It's a non-alcoholic beer. Right. Technically, even though it's less than 0.5. Well, that's the definition of a non-alcoholic beer. Less than 0.5. Yeah, exactly. Can, if I'm an alcoholic, can I still drink this? Sure, you can drink it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You can drink anything. (laughs) Yeah, you can still drink it. I mean, yeah, I think, I think honestly, honestly that, you know, that would really be the preference of of whoever is going to drink it and and where they feel comfortable. So no, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend for or against, but it's certainly a non-alcoholic beverage. And certainly, um, certainly, you know, I will have a few of these and I'll be driving home later today. So these yeah. are pretty delicious. So how, what yeah, you, into you didn't tell me what brew? you thought of this. I like it. It drinks easy. Right. It's great. So that I think is what we were going for with this. Like it drinks easy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things you can go for, like making a beer. And I think if you put this beside a few other beers, like maybe somebody's doing a non-alcoholic IPA or maybe somebody's doing a non-alcoholic milk stout or something. And you ask them and you ask like somebody who's kind of just coming in blind to say, well, which one's like the most interesting? Mm -hmm. I don't think ours would be the most interesting. That's not what we're going for. Sure. What we're going for is we want something that is going to be drinkable. Yeah. And that people um, are going to be able to, you know, have with their lunch because it's fairly good pairing. Um, But also they're going to be able to have like one or two, like if they're trying to drink with one of their friends who's having a few pints, like... I've had a few of these in a row and I still feel like, yeah, you know, I'm happy with the taste of this. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of more what we're going for. And, uh, it almost is like a holiday drinker. Like I could be at a holiday party, just drinking a ton of these and feel good about it and then drive home and then drive fine. Home. I mean, yeah, you gotta have some, you, know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta mix up your holiday parties, I think, but, uh, don't you worry. There's plenty in town. Is this a low carb thing or is it a no carb thing? Yeah. So here's the thing about non-alcoholic. Once you go non-alcoholic, you're cutting out a ton of carbs. Right. Because alcohol is like in a, in a lager, alcohol um, is going to be like close to half of the carbs. So you're down below 50. Um, in this? For the 0.5. Yeah. Okay. And so when you, when you choose to, let's say, market it a certain way, yeah. it's funny. So I look at this, I say less than 0.5. Right. right. And so I think it's a low alcohol beer. Right, right. To your point, it's enough for you to constitute a non-alcoholic beer. But because I know it's less than 0.5, I don't even know if that's true, but you've branded it that way. Right. It makes me feel better about it than a completely yeah. non-alcoholic beer. That's totally psychological. Okay, but from, from a marketing perspective, I dig it. It's like there might be some in there. I don't know how much. Just 0.49. <laughs> so, yeah, I think... 
a lot of brewers right now are they're trying to figure out uh, what do consumers generally understand to be non-alcoholic versus say alcoholic free or low alcohol okay and i would say there generally isn't a clear understanding of exactly what all these different terms mean yeah that's very true i and certainly have no idea now there, there are important technical points though because you know this is this is 0.5 less than 0.5 percent so you would literally need to drink like a six pack or a few six packs per hour to come close to like your <laughs> your limit for driving right okay now um the taste here is a very close match on on the alcoholic version now alcohol does have a flavor it's kind of a sweetness so mm -hmm. you're never going to get exact match but this is designed to get an extremely close match now the further you go down in alcohol so if you want to go down like from say point you know four or five which is this it's a bit lower than 0.5 say you want to go down to point you know zero five or point zero two and, and we can do that as well with our technology but you do move further away on the flavor interesting yeah does it taste more and more like water or is it just is it a different taste i wouldn't say more and more like water because you do retain very very well like things like sugars and some of the larger flavor molecules you just start losing the aroma profile a bit more okay yeah and so when i th also when it comes to this beer is there a big market is there a growing market what right. does that look like in terms because i know in let's say london as an example yeah i have a friend in london who's currently making a non-alcoholic gin right. and i ask him like what's the story with this and in london obviously there's a huge pub culture you leave work you're at the pub yeah, yeah and it's yeah. huge i mean i've been there on monday and tuesday and these places are full and so there's a growing concern for for just people who want to go to the bar and be at the bar and still be yeah. social but they don't want to drink they don't want to have alcohol and so I realize like there might be a market in, in, let's say, places like London. Is it the same nationwide or what is it? Yeah, so I think, and we're seeing a lot of it because we, we have a product now in Ireland, okay. um, Twisted Barley, which is non-alcoholic. Um, and we have a product here. So we're seeing like how both markets compare. Yeah. And the European market is just way ahead in terms of non-alcoholic. Okay. And I would say Ireland is even like it's it's um later on the curve uh well it's later later in time. than america or so it's basically like germany netherlands is really really early okay and then there's ireland They're probably ireland, uk okay yeah so like germany i think is doing maybe 10 percent or more really beer is non-alcoholic what's driving it do you know germany historically has done quite a bit of non-alcoholic okay um so i think some of it is just there um in ireland a big driver is to drink driving laws the mm. the limit is very very tight and um people really can't like drink a beer if you want to be driving at all so, do you know the yeah. limit off the top of your head how it, and because i think in the u.s it's what seven or point oh eight point oh eight yeah, yeah yeah i don't know it offhand and i know there's like a few different metrics mm. like blood or urine and all this sure so actually the irish limit has dropped i think a few times but I, I just know from friends like we wouldn't even drink a pint if we were going to drive so oh it's that low yeah, yeah okay yeah. do the yeah. laws change so i was in australia and during their holiday during holiday in australia it's like one they're everywhere the police they can pull you over for any reason and it's one of those where the rules get tighter during the holiday and oh, yeah. the fines go up like double to five dynamic. times dynamic which is, yeah, yeah yeah exactly dynamic rate setting as it comes to fines yeah. is it the same or not do you know i don't think we're as big on dynamic i think we're trying to get dynamic on speed limits so and stuff crazy. but uh, yeah no um the thing in ireland is just the limit is low plus if you do get caught drink driving i think you lose your license immediately for like six months maybe. okay so there's a very like i have a friend who's a veterinarian and he his life relies on driving around from uh you know from farm to farm or from clients and yeah. so he says to me like he would never ever risk you know not having his license because he'd be in real trouble then you know so in this case basically what's happening is the laws are creating a market for people to be social enjoy some sort of alcoholic beverage or not non-alcoholic but have the taste and then be able to carry on with their lives without the fear of getting or losing their license yeah so i think that's a factor i okay. don't think it's the only factor i think there's kind of the low calorie side of things i think there's also just the the kind of mindset of you know working uh, maybe with folks our age sure uh, where you want to work and you don't want to be impacted by having an influence of alcohol while you're working yeah so i think that's playing in as well okay um i also would say 
the market obviously has fallen a lot for sodas for you know fizzy drinks as we say in ireland and um you know that's all liquid that people were consuming mm -hmm. and people are still going to be consuming liquid so there's got to be something that's replacing that oh, that's so interesting yeah and so <laughs> yeah i mean what's like people are not right. just stopping to drink liquids right yeah. they're drinking something the liquid else business is booming it's, it's what liquid that's booming yeah i think you know sparkling water has done very well in that yes. category i think playing off that the hard seltzers have done well um you know sparkling flavored waters have done well the kombuchas are maybe a bit more niche i'm not sure the penetrations is large on that sure but um yeah sparkling water and i, I do think non-alcoholic beer i think it will definitely play a role between kombucha and sparkling water yeah i in never thought of, of that but that's where i put it maybe i guess it makes sense in terms of your marketing do you is it mostly males that you're trying to go after is it thoughtful to that degree male female what's the market because i know like in terms of beer drinking yeah so like the female's been neglected in a lot of ways as it relates to marketing right, and right. so the fizzy drinks have like the, the spike seltzers are all of a sudden the female market but there's some females that just want to drink a beer and they right, don't right, right. they actually hate the spike seltzer and so there's a sort of this land grab of opportunity on that market do you know how this does or, or where do you distribute this yeah wow a lot of questions there. yeah um i don't think at this point like there's enough intent on our side sure. to directly market to specific demographics mm -hmm. we were optimizing for getting something on the market that would allow us to get some feedback um, and also would allow us to get non-alcoholic on draft um which is something that you know is very new to have non-alcoholic beer on draft yeah um so that's what we were optimizing for i think there's improvements to be made on design so you know I think when we go around the next iteration, there's things like, will we make the fonts a little bit softer? Will sure. we go for a little bit more neutral mm -hmm. color? Um, I think we do want to try go for broad appeal because we've already made the decision we're going for, you know, a Pilsner that then has alcohol removed. Mm -hmm. um, so we want that broad appeal. And I think we would probably want to try get that with the with the branding as well. And so where is this now on draft here? Yeah, um, anywhere here in Massachusetts? right now we're just on bottles in central square okay yeah in cambridge how is that so looking how are the sales we literally launched last week oh congrats yeah yeah I'll what is that like getting the first sales report like in later this month yeah. yeah do you get to decide where it goes or it's up to them well we target specific venues okay and then we you know see if they'll take it in or not yeah and uh you're at an advantage when you're coming out of mit and you're saying this is a local brand here totally i think the non-alcoholic is also in a good place because it's it's at the early stage of the peak i guess i didn't answer that question but the u.s non-alc penetration is probably less than one percent right now wow so it's got it's got like the lowest level but it's got probably the most growth so in ireland we find it hmm. we find it a lot easier with getting draft machines installed so this um, is on draft in ireland in ireland we have non-alc on draft yeah okay. under the twisted barley brand that's right you mentioned that and so from your perspective what are the advantages to using your process when you're going to deliver more more of the product you're not delivering you're not bringing a keg right? right even like in terms of shipping we we have been like because time is of the essence right now to getting launched we've been air freighting kegs and like the cost would have been insane if they were full with water kegs right yeah, yeah yeah so like we're able to fit the equivalent of like i think we can fit the equivalent of 80 normal kegs on a single pallet and for a fraction of the cost yeah i mean that normally That's the other part normally you'd have that on five or six pallets so. yeah so that's an interesting advantage that you're you have there as what do you what is it that they get what is it that they're actually installing at the, in bar? the bar yeah it's a box how and big the, is the box is the it box like a is tissue about, box um this size okay yeah. okay so, so for those so like just, a shoe box size yeah kind of. i mean if you're literally talking about a shoe box it's probably like two shoe six boxes? shoe boxes oh okay okay you know kind of a, a two by three matrix gotcha. two on the bottom and then three, three layers stack. okay yeah that's what it looks like um and that box you know filters cools carbonates the water and blends it with the high gravity beer and is that size troublesome for the bars or is it the same size as a normal size keg effect like the same space yeah so there's two options where you put it you either put it under the counter if you're in a restaurant or cafe okay. or if you're in a bar and you have bar lines like keg lines coming up you put it down where the kegs are okay yeah yeah so it could go in the cold oh does it have to go in the cold room it doesn't have to no it could go outside the cold room yeah oh, so that makes it even easier for them yeah right so the big thing for bars is like instead of having to lug these massive kegs which weigh you know 120 pounds 
you have a keg that weighs like 10 kilos and like anyone's able to just carry that you know one-handed walk down the stairs yeah um, so you're talking about space savings handling and then deliveries are much less frequent so you're going to be you're going to be good on that front yeah i find this so fascinating do you ever envision going to a brewery and the entire space is full of your concept a bar a bar yeah yeah that's going to happen it will right yeah we're already looking at machines for doing eight to ten taps next year one machine yeah, for the bar. That's right, because you can share a lot of the processes. That's right. That's right, yeah. And so you're just swapping out the concentrate. Yeah, you have your lines all coming into the oh, box. so many questions. And then the <clears throat> lines coming back out to the taps. So have you ever just thought about becoming the, the like the Coca-Cola of the world where you're just literally creating the concentrate? And then, right, seems like a no-brainer. Then you just have different lines. You have your Coke, you have your Sprite, you have your... Yeah, so... Orange I mean, soda. <clears throat> Come back to me in one year. I don't think this will change, though. Our business is providing technology to brewers, mm-hmm. um, providing the the Revos machines, which remove the water, and, and being the step in the process that provides that quality assurance. Um, and secondly, providing the machines and the quality assurance around the point of dispense to ensure the water quality is good and it's being blended accurately. Yeah. So that's where I see our business providing those machines and, and services. You know, we do have this 0.5 brand, I would love to see 0.5 be successful. I enjoy drinking a few myself. Yeah, um, they're good. They're easy to drink. They're too easy to drink, I think. <laughs> but it's a support. It's a support for um, the brewers. for the main business. We do also have a site in upstate New York where we can provide um, as a service. Um, we can provide kegs of concentrate. So if somebody ships us a tanker of beer, we can uh, reduce that down for them, and then they can supply our network of draft machines. And we're setting up one in the UK as well that will be able to do that as a service. So you can take any beer? Yeah. So if I'm a brewer, I have this amazing beer, I give it to you. Yeah, right. You can bring it down to a concentrate format and then... Then you can get those kegs out to the draft venues. Yeah. On a national scale though. Right. Right. Do you have anything in California? Not yet. No, no. Okay. I think the the site in New York should be fine, at least for, for... Because we're reducing the transport so much, it should be fine for serving the US at least for the next year or two. Yeah. And... um I would love to get some draft machines out in California. Right now we're focused on Cambridge, Boston, and that's where we want to we want to get flag. up to 100 machines by um, second quarter next year. Okay. But um definitely think we would go. I mean New York probably first, but then just because it's closer. What's the cost per machine? So you said 100 machines. What what kind of money are we talking about for the machines that go into the bars? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could be looking at um depending on how many taps you're going to be doing, you know, you could be looking at um, a few thousand dollars, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be much different than the costs incurred in like putting in normal kind of keg lines, machines, all of that set up for doing draft beer. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty much in line with that. So that's a good competitive advantage. Then you can say that, you know, look, you're going to be spending this money either way. Why not make it go our way? Yeah. Look, I mean, it's a change in how, bars are doing things so i wouldn't say people see it as no burden they see it as having to you know adopt to a new way now i would say the feedback from bars is generally being positive and the thing that they're just thinking about is yeah i saw somebody falling down the stairs with a keg right yeah and they're like yeah that's not as much a money decision it's kind of like there's a liability there. there's a liability and there's also <laughs> i walked down to my this is what one guy said there last week i walked down to my keg room two two weeks ago and i don't know who manages that but it's you know it's an absolute mess yeah keg rooms are are tough to manage heavy items and a lot of lines going around so that's the thing I was thinking about too. And so if, if I'm a brewery in an existing space, I'm spending money one on, on the lines, right? So the lines have to run underground from the cold room. If you're so, a bar. If I'm a bar, yeah. yeah right. They have to run underground. i am spent money there to the sump pump. I spent money there. And then I'm basically locked into where my taps are because they all connect. The lines all go from the tap all the way down into the cold room. Right, right, right. With you, they could have taps everywhere in essence, right? Because they don't need to connect at all to the tap line to the tap room the cold room yeah that's true if they wanted to put an isolated unit out somewhere yeah um, it makes it easy it would be like no different than them just taking a keg obviously it wouldn't be refrigerated but they could just do it for whatever for an event just like a quick yeah so that's definitely true for an event it's definitely it's a good option for that yeah you know bars this like depending on the bar they'll serve a lot of volume so they go to quite some effort to have very well organized like lines going from kegs to taps and they'll yes. have like a single keg in the basement that's able to serve multiple taps. Mm-hmm. And the industry is very expert at 
setting that up in a very high quality way you know for delivering the beer i would say current lines deliver very good quality today if they're well maintained and everything so i think that'll be that'll be essential for us to make good headway will be to provide the reassurance around the quality yeah that each brand is going to still have a beer that tastes the same regardless of which premise it's been served at Mm because that means a lot to a beer brand how much does one of these six packs go for I think they're maybe around uh, eleven dollars in Central Square. Okay. When you first started your company, at what point did you have to raise money? Uh, at what point? How do you define uh, what point? So you had your concept, right? Right. You, you sort of had it vetted. Um, yeah. At what point? I guess it's interesting with your company in particular. I mean, how you had you needed some capital to to just move along, right? Were you bootstrapping it yourself? Yeah. So. I was bootstrapping it by myself and I had kind of a bottle a day. So I had a a kind of demo and taste and the kind of chicken and egg problem I had was I had brewers that would be willing to do some trials and to get samples, but the value they saw from the samples was not quite as high as the cost of me setting up a facility that could make those samples yeah what was their yeah. value that they saw at the beginning just to have it in yeah. concentrate for what though? right at the start you know we would have been doing samples a few hundred dollars yeah yeah but what would they do with it they would just taste it they might run it on analysis and, and that's it that's it for the samples yeah i mean that's what they want to know they want to know it tastes good that means a lot okay yeah. and then what was the next step once it once it sort of checked that box like was yeah. it you introducing the whole concept to them around being able to save a tremendous amount of money on shipping or were they able to piece that together pretty quickly that that i think they pieced together okay so that was not a lot of time spent in okay. the first year and a half of the business okay and then pretty once... much time was spent on delivering high quality samples and then delivering systems of progressively larger scale to show that it was technically feasible as it scaled and how long did that take yeah. um well we built our first at scale system um, around this time last year. So we delivered our first one to a client this year. Uh, the first unit was for rentals. That system still is owned by us. And then we delivered a unit. And did um, you have to raise year. money before that? Yeah. So we raised money three and a half years ago in 2016. Okay. And with that, we set up a test facility in Somerville, just out, just near Cambridge. Yeah. And that allowed us to produce the first batches of samples. Plus, it allowed us to have people visit and then pay us to do a trial on their beer. So they would send us kegs. Mm-hmm. We would put the kegs through the system and they would, you know, come and taste their own beer. What was that like? That was the part where I was saying <laughs> about sitting around the table with mm-hmm. kind of like the brewmaster and with, uh, you know, some business technical person. And then you're trying to get them to the point of testing a larger scale system. When you say larger scale, what does that mean? Um, Either in terms well, of production? I guess... For those of uh, you who are in Boston area, there's a brewery called Harpoon. Mm-hmm. So one of our large machines does roughly the same annual throughput as Harpoon as a company. Really? So it's pretty large. And Harpoon would be in the top you know, 25 craft brewers in the US. Yeah, their facility is pretty big. So your one machine can put out the same output? Right, right. So yeah, I guess How other, big is that other ways to think about it is um, in terms of like barrels per year, mm-hmm. you're talking about you know, a few hundred thousand barrels a year. So I guess in terms of liters, you're talking about, you know, um, tens of millions of liters per year. That machine is like the size of a 40 foot container. Okay. So it's not insane. Like it's it's a very smaller portion of the brewery footprint. That's incredible. Yeah, I guess, you know, technology now is pretty dense, at least um, what we're able to do with the membranes. I mean, that's honestly incredible when I think about like harpoon is huge it would be like you walking into five or six border x breweries so so anyone listening just think of your normal brewery where they're act, like brewery plus plus tasting room It'd be like five or six of those is kind of the size of harpoon yeah right and you're replacing that with a 40 foot container well definitely not replacing but you're but you're integrating the you're output integrating is the equal unit. yeah 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 and so way less of a, a footprint are you not no, shocked by you that? Know, cost savings <laughs> all around. I'm thinking like you don't have to invest in such a big space anymore, too. You don't need, right? You wouldn't need a big. But you still need kegs, right? You still need to. Like, you still need kegs, but. But yes. If if the machines are being replaced by this one forty foot shipping container sized uh, machine, 
then that's much less forum space that you're taking up and, and back room and the equipment costs, all that good stuff. I don't know. The savings are good. I wouldn't go overboard with saying like it's it's saving a brewery a ton of space. It saves them some tank space because they're now storing tanks that are at higher gravity, higher right. alcohol. So they need less tanks for the storage on that aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, the beer is still traditionally brewed. So it's still going through, you know, into wort. It's being fermented. So all that stuff is, is standard. And uh, I think that's one of the things that has allowed us to get traction with brewers is that we don't change how the brewing works because beer profile is still not something fully scientific. Um, it really matters what kind of yeast and conditions and recipe that's almost trial and error. And um, hmm. if you had to make a high gravity or high alcohol beer for transport by reformulating the brewing process, um, I'm pretty confident you wouldn't get the same flavor profile. And when you're talking about brands that have been around for, you know, decades, centuries, yeah, that's not something that, you know, a brand will want to change. And you're working with some of those brands. Yeah, right. I what mean, is that like? You know, we're doing transport. So if we're doing transport, you got to focus on the brewers transporting a lot of volume and yeah a lot of the volume is owned by a relatively small number of brewers so that's an important world for us to to play in if we're going to be successful um i think you know just kind of like on the top down we've got our our machine business Mm -hmm. and then from bottom up this is a bit more bottom up because we're you know doing our own brand here to to show traction of the technology so what made you want to do this the beer part about creating your own beer so i wanted to find the quickest possible way to get machines into bars and the quickest way that um our team came up with was why don't we just like make (laughs) Make a product ourselves right why don't we make it non-alcoholic because then it's going to be a lot quicker to distribute because there's a lot less regulation around distribution yeah than if you had to get wholesaler license and you know that's a lot more complicated right that's so and also because you always, you know, as you would probably say, um, you want to be in a growing market <laughs> if you want to get traction. Yeah. So you're much easier to convince somebody to take in an NA if that's a growing category than if we to try and go in with a beer. So would we create our own beer brand? You know, I wouldn't rule it out, but I wouldn't say it would be, it's not higher on our list of things to do. Yeah. Um, NA, not But NA, if, if you want to get in there with draft, well... How about we get in with something that's growing? How about we get in with something where we've competitive advantage on taste because we've got a good separation process? I like that you picked the so. Pilsner too because when you... So one of the things we talk to other, let's say, brewers about is when they create a beer yep. that doesn't have a name or that sounds like something that doesn't exist in the marketplace. It's tough because if, I, mm-hmm. if I'm just a patron and I come into your bar and I want a Pilsner but you're not making a Pilsner. You've made some offshoot name that no one knows yet because you're right. introducing a brand new concept. Then how do I order your beer, right? It's tough. Right, right. But right. in your case, you've just made it a Pilsner. And so if right, I want right. to go, I'm like, hey, can I get a non-alcoholic Pilsner? It's perfect. Right, right. You've attacked a large market in that way. So technically, by the way, though, um, you'll notice that we don't actually have Pilsner written on it. You, there's, can you not? There's a strange law at the moment whereby you can't use beer styles within the name of a brand for a non-alcoholic beer what's the premise of the law i'm afraid i don't i don't have any logic i just kind of have the way that it is um i think that you know it maybe hasn't been as big an issue in the past because non-alcoholic was such a big category and um so i I, i'd be hopeful that there'd be some changes there that will um you know allow people to try different styles in non-alcoholic yeah so yeah i guess i can say we brewed this as a pilsner and we removed the alcohol from it that's interesting. So. <laughs> well, it's certainly delicious. I always think about, one, how big this market is going to end up actually being. That's right, one thing right, I'm right. super curious about. Right. Will, like, will it be as big on? as Europe? Will it be as big as yeah, Europe? Yeah, yeah. Is it as much of a concern? I don't know. And then it, it's almost like once I'm at that point of discussion, my mind goes into, and you, you sort of commented on this earlier, it's you have to choose, is it the non-alcoholic that I'm marketing or is it the low carb that I'm marketing? In LA specifically, there's a lot of people who want to enjoy right, right, something right. that tastes fizzy, might taste like a beer, but doesn't ruin their weekend and keeps them fit all at the same time. Yeah. And so it's like, which one do you have to choose or do you have to choose? I don't know. There's just a lot of green space. Like I don't know much about marketing at all. And um, so I go into it thinking about, well, there's broadly two roads here I could take. One road is, I could try go deep on the analysis and like figure out the categories and decide strategically to target, you know, 
25 year old Diego's or whatever the category might be. And the other approach is I can, which is very unscientific, is just saying, well, you know, if I wanted a non-alcoholic beer, I like (laughs) Pilsner's. And um, so this is the beer I would drink. Right. So might be terrible targeting of the category. At least I'll be passionate about it because I like like what it it tastes. Yeah. And I think we've kind of allowed that as a team to drive our choices till now. Partly also because it's um, it's an expedient way as well to get um, some product out there that we also feel passionate about. So totally. That's kind of how we've done it now. Whether that's a good decision, time will tell. Time will tell. I think you're in a good yeah. spot. When you Whenever you work with these huge players, so outside of the beer, but back to yeah. the, I guess, your core business. The core, yeah. Yeah. What is, what is that like working with these huge players? Is it slow? I mean, are you traveling a bunch to visit them? Do you go overseas? What, what is that like? Because in some way you're you're complete. You have the ability to change their business in a very meaningful way, right? And these large companies want to be extremely thoughtful, right, about how they spend their money, how they go down that road with you. So as an entrepreneur, I can imagine that's two things, right? One, it's amazing that the opportunity right. is available to you, but two, it's daunting because you still have to run a business. You still have to keep the lights on. Money needs to be coming in the door, and you're basically chasing elephants. Yeah. Right. And it's a slow, you're just chipping away little by little by little. I will say first that two things I think are very important are, first of all, working with more than one. Mm. So you got to have, <laughs> you got to have at least two, yeah. preferably three, four, five. Um, okay. And you want to be. How many are there? There's not that many large super, right? Well, the top 10 have 64% of volume. So yeah, it's pretty consolidated. Okay. You know, and, and we would consider for doing large scale installations like, try and target the top 40 brewers broadly speaking across the world sure the world but yeah very important i found to have multiple players interested and trying to trying to get them at the same part of the process so that you have competition for that trial spot or renting the same machine mm. or getting a week of operation on our unit in new york so constantly trying to funnel things into you know scarcity yeah <laughs> so that's really important and i'm not saying i've been able to do that at all times <laughs> um, but um, that's been kind of critical to to getting the financial support from brewers. Another thing is, which we've done more on with like point five, is showing the reality, showing that it can what be real, showing okay. that it's going to. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've got to talk, stop talking in broad terms. It's not <laughs> useful. Um, showing them that people are drinking it. They're being served from a Sandy Mount draft machine. Yes. They're drinking a, a 0.5 from our Revos NA technology. Yeah. You know, people are actually drinking this and it's happening end to end because when you look at something that's not in existence, there's an infinite number of problem points where exactly. you can find an issue. Right. And the only real easy. answer to that is just it's happening. Right. Because it's, if, if it's happening, anything that might have been an issue clearly wasn't enough of an issue to stop it so was that a light bulb moment for you where you were like we just need to get something in the market so that we can offset some of these um, these what ifs that was a light bulb moment this year for draft yeah yeah when we thought about what's the quickest way to get draft in with big brewers we yeah. thought let's get draft machines in the field as soon as possible yeah yeah and how long did That's that take you to that. from the thought process to to even making it well we launched we we thought about we started launching point five over the summer like that's when we developed the launch plan so okay. we really turned that around very very quickly yeah um to the extent that that's why it's in bottles not cans because the lead time for cans would have been too long to get it done in cans mm. is that right <laughs> yeah yeah it's basically longer. everybody's going to cans right now so there's like a lot of sh- long lead times for getting cans made uh, do you know why everyone's going to cans the cost of glass is expensive it's so heavy. i mean I'm going to throw out some reasons. I actually don't think I know the real full reason, but um, craft has moved to cans a lot, which hmm. is not a fundamental reason, but there's been a trend in craft towards cans. Cans are better for quality. Um, they will have lower oxygen ingress. So over huh. time, a can will deliver better quality if it's packaged well um, compared to a bottle. Cans are you know less heavy, so there's a distribution benefit. Um, there's also like the blo- broken glass issue. So if you have the the can, you can maybe bring it more flexibly in a backpack or, mm-hmm. you know, for the beach or whatever. Um, of course, the bottles, people can perceive higher quality from bottles historically. It, you know, stays colder for longer. People, you know, associated apparently with, um, 
I'm just replaying back marketing things I've heard. But <laughs> sure. <laughs> people associate it with premium quality, okay. you know, with import. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a lot of bottles still, you know, in Europe. And there's still a lot of bottle in the US as well. Where did the name of your company come from, Sandy Mount? Yeah, that's a good one. I So I actually incorporated the business a little bit earlier than when we raised money because I got an option from MIT to mm -hmm. get a license which was important before I'd engage with brewers. Yeah. Um, so I could say, oh, okay, I've got the option. Now we can talk. A license about to use the technology. Yeah, yeah. An yeah. option to a license. Okay. Because yeah. MIT, then, they keep it, right? Or right. So if something's developed in the lab, MIT labs, they, they retain it? Yeah, they own, the, they own the, the patent. The IP? Yeah. Yeah. So they own one of the patents that we have. We have other ones that we now own. Okay. But they own one of them. And so originally I would have taken an option to license it. Yeah. And then once I raise money... I executed the option and um, signed a full license agreement. Got it. So now we have an exclusive license for that piece of uh, IP. That's. Uh, Are they pretty good about that? Yeah. MIT? MIT have been really good. Okay. They're not on you. They're not sending you an invoice being like, hey. <laughs> oh, we're paying them money, but um, that's a good thing. I mean, I think that's exciting for them. There's maybe a limited number of technologies that end up getting into the black and, totally. and paying back royalties. Yeah. So that's. I think that's really exciting. And yeah, I mean... <laughs> I obviously am only just one experience going through. I think most people have been happy, but the people I know there, I've had a good relationship with, and I see it as a positive that we have IP now um, that is from MIT. What the question was I the, answering? Well, the, the, name, the name of the company. The name oh, yeah, sorry. Right. I just got really... interested in what you were saying. Um, Sandy Mount. So the name <laughs> is, um, it's basically a beach where my grandmother used to go for walks. Oh, okay. Yeah. and um, In Ireland? Yeah, it's in Dublin. Sandy Mount. But the hilarious thing is that actually, I, this shows how fast I was doing it. The name of the beach um, is actually Sandy Cove. Oh. So it's Sandy Cove Beach. And, um, <laughs> but I wasn't thinking clearly on that day. And so when I came back, you know, all the incorporation documents were filed. And Sandy Mount exists. It's like literally down the, down the coast, like up the coast a little bit from where Sandy Cove is. Okay. So it was Sandy Cove. She would also have gone for walks in Sandy Mount. <laughs> I mean, I really could have picked a lot of beaches in Dublin and I would have been fine, but uh, that's where it came from, yeah. And when it comes to so. the, like growing your company, do you just really just focus on the top, you mentioned the top 45 or the top 25 and you're constantly in touch with them or what? what is that like? Are you engaged with all of them in some way? Have some people said no? Is it just a function of you just continuing to, to kind of poke at them? yeah so i mean that 40 is global so sure. you know there's a good chunk of those in say china japan okay where we I don't see. really have much penetration at the moment yeah we're pretty focused on kind of north america and europe um i think we're starting to learn we have a team member abby who's um in asia at the moment but we're more just learning about the market and seeing you know if and when it'll make sense to to do some projects there is there anything um, that's vastly different about the asian market yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of significant differences and okay. I don't fully appreciate them, but the stage of, you know, adoption of beer, beer is something that's more recent. I'm not saying like the last few years, but it's more recent in history uh -huh. than what it would have been in Europe and the US, as I understand. Okay. Um, you know, the stage of progression towards non-alcoholic, the stage of progression towards craft is at, you know, a much earlier stage than what it would be Got in it. Europe. Got it. Um, you know, the price points are different um you know the price points are different they're just lower yeah um for for what beer is being sold for um shipping routes also are kind of interesting so there's this weird thing whereby so much product comes out of asia not beer but um, i mean there's some beer but a lot of electronics you know i don't even know specifically but yeah we've got a lot of consumer goods from asia mm -hmm. so all these containers are coming this way and then that means there's a ton of containers available to go back so there's actually like a lot cheaper to ship stuff to asia than to ship stuff from asia interesting you see yeah so it's close to i won't say it's free but it's pretty cheap to send containers back to asia whereas the cost of shipping out of asia is pretty high it's which obviously impacts how we think about things because yeah you know we're thinking about transport so as we begin a new decade do you when when, when planning your business when thinking about let's say 2020 yeah do you what does 2020 look like for you and then 
is 2030 on your on your radar is 2030 on the radar <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know if 2025 is on the radar <laughs> i think um 2020 looks like um getting our our hub is already up and running in in the us um getting that hub more established getting more volume through it getting our hub up and running in europe for the first time um we haven't fully finalized the site but we're pretty close to that mm -hmm. so that'll be two major events getting draft machines we've got a plan for getting 100 machines up and going by the second quarter next year in both the us and in europe okay so that's going to be that's going to be pretty critical for us as well yeah and then that's kind of all of the that's kind of all of the bottom-up activities of course there's the top town engagements with the brewers and you know they each have kind of specific rollout plans around what they want to achieve either on draft or either for you know export so yeah I need to keep us busy on that front as well. Do you ever get uh, asked for an acqu like acquisition offers from these guys? I think early on, like maybe about two years ago, there was uh, you know some interest. I don't even know what an acquisition offer or approach fully looks like because I guess this is my first business going around. So yeah, I guess they'd be buying the technology would be one. Yeah, I mean, I think and the inability. They, basically, they'd be buying the market from you. One thing I think that's interesting about Sanimat for them is that we do have a bit of vertical integration now because we provide not just Revos for making the high gravity beer, but we also provide the dispense unit for the bars. Um, so they're able to kind of go fully along that vertical. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of process engineering companies, if they were doing what we're doing, they would just focus on doing the membrane technology and they would probably not just focus on beer. They would do like beer, orange juice, milk, lots of different liquids yeah so i think it's actually to our advantage that we really focus on beer interesting um, and we know beer really well i'm not saying like i definitely know less than most of my clients do um sure than all of my paying clients but um <laughs> yeah i think it's to our advantage that you're we, focused that on. we're focused on beer yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. what's so. your advice to any entrepreneur listening around either starting or yeah just around starting a company taking an idea that you had and and where you're at today i like the reading books one you know i like the one about reading books about or by people who were successful yeah do you have a favorite do you have a top three um my favorite startup book is peter Thiel's book zero to one okay yeah what do you like about that one i just think he has a few good nuggets about about how he thinks about scaling like the importance of um avoiding competition you know that's something i talked about with our team earlier this week and how we've got to stay focused on getting revos out there for allowing this new supply chain mm -hmm. um and, and not get distracted by developing other products where we've less of a competitive advantage mm -hmm. so that's one thing i like about it you know he has a comment about trying to hire people who are full-time because part-time can really take more effort and there's not you know the long-term commitment there yeah so trying to build a team and, and trying to prioritize having people that are that are there full time is something I think about. Um, yeah, it's true because you can teach someone your entire system, spend a lot of time doing yeah. that, and then if they're part time, they just leave. Yeah, right. And they take the knowledge here, then you're you're at zero all over again. Yeah, and the other thing is like if somebody's full time, you can rely that they're going to be there if something goes wrong. They're not working on another job. Right. Which is important when you're in startup phase for like a you know a machine because things always go wrong. So yeah, you need. I think it's reliability is a part of that as well. One decision that definitely you underappreciate is when you start your business, you don't realize how many decisions you're making at that point when you just get into that business mm -hmm. that are going to like determine the extent of the business's success. L let's just take Sanium out. Like we're doing beer and we're doing beer transport. You know, we're not going to move into doing a software business for finding, you know, a cheap lease on a house. Right. So we're, we're constrained within doing beer. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a certain profile of competitive advantage, which for us is mostly IP because we have these patent filings. Right. Um, we also have these strong client relationships um, with big brewers that, you know, are hopefully going to sustain over time. So there's that potential to have a lasting stream of revenue. Yeah. So there are some of the benefits. What are some of the drawbacks? Well, we have got you know a relatively small pool of clients which means that the clients have more bargaining power mm -hmm. over the pricing so that's not as good as being in a business where i'm selling to you know 20,000 uh small businesses right where they don't have pricing power right? right do you struggle with the patience of having to stay in your lane or you, have you just accepted it you get it 
there's some things I know are for sure fixed. And then you have to accept those things as you move forward. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes there's things and you wonder, well, maybe there's something I could improve about the fundamentals of what we're doing here. Yeah. That's not already tied in. And, and how far is it OK for me to deviate from what, you know, the original business I entered into was? And some people pivot successfully, I suppose. So right. um, it's not to say maybe you can't change lane. But yeah, I guess, what am I saying? The impact of your business. I think the original point I was trying to say is that, yeah, a lot of the impact of your business is determined by some pretty early decisions, which for me were made at a time where I knew a lot less about running a business right. or your scaling hypothesis a business. testing almost. Yeah, yeah. I suppose if you do manage to grow a business long term and keep keep the business, then you do start to be able to maybe have more flexibility in different areas you can get into. Like, you know, Amazon is clearly in a lot of different areas now, whereas sure. they started with books. Um, so given enough skill success, <laughs> yeah, maybe that maybe that buys you some flexibility over time that, that you can kind of, you know, chart that course. But yeah. um, you know, we're talking about a three year time scale, three and a half since I started. So sure. you know, we're not thinking about moving into adjacent businesses or things like that right still early. so so we're we're working on the same basis we we started this business on you know for people listening we tell them where they can find you website instagram oh yeah that's not easy yeah <laughs> yeah I, I don't know send, send me an email mcgovern at sandymount.com yeah i do have twitter I, I realize i'm really not as good at going on social media as i thought i might be sure um so i might send out the odd tweet um but yeah and it's, then people it's can find less account. than point 0.5 at central yeah. square point central square in cambridge point 0.5 brewing.com that's correct yeah so you can find that online and and we do have social media accounts for point 0.5 we have sandymount.com as well well thank you for coming on the podcast yeah of course yeah, thank you brother yeah we here at startup the storefront would love to hear feedback from you reach out and let us know what you think either through rating us on the podcast app or by sliding into our DMs. You can find us both on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. Our theme song is composed by Double Touch. If you want to learn more about the products and businesses featured on today's episode, check out the links in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more great guests coming up that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.